This is Captain Arse in the Ghost Striker. I'm being attacked by Cobra Rattlers. I'm returning fire. What's going on up there, Arse? Report! These guys are good. They're dodging my machine gun fire. I'm switching to targeting computer. Use the force, you Arse. Oh. Arse, you've switched off your targeting computer. What's wrong? It's all right. I'm using the force. Don't do it, Arse. Your ego is writing checks that exceed your body's overdraft protection. You'll get a $25 fee. Wow, I missed. That didn't work at all. It's almost like the Force is some vague concept from an action science fiction movie and shouldn't be taken too seriously. And I shouldn't follow advice from voices in my head. Return to base, Arse. You're in too deep. You're holding on too tight. You've lost the edge. You don't own that plane. The taxpayers do. I want some butts. There's one more thing I can try. Deploy the control grip and activate the giant hand. You guys are so screwed now! God move! Ah, oh, the pilots escaped. I'll get you guys next time. What's that down there? Illinois Nazis? I hate Illinois Nazis. Got him! Look, there's Hitler! Eat some neon orange missiles, Hitler! Yeah! And there's the coronavirus! Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here. This is the show where we review every vintage G.I. Joe toy from 1982 to 1994. 2020 is the year of the 90s, so we're looking at a lot of 90s G.I. Joe toys this year. Before we get started, I have the privilege of giving a code name to another patron. Elise Christie has added to her support on Patreon. Elise is so awesome, she is all the sub teams rolled into one. Her code name is Iron Steel Tiger Grenadier Elimination Eco Brigade Force. Thank you for your support. Special shout out to JJ's Toy Room for donating the Ace figure for this review. This week we are going to dispel some of the myths of G.I. Joe in the 1990s. The myth is that G.I. Joe in the 90s moved away from its real world military inspiration. The 90s are portrayed as a decade of gaudy colors, over the top extremism, and goofy knockoffs of other popular toys. Is that really true? Yes, most of the time, but not always. Case in point is the subject of this week's review. In 1993, G.I. Joe gave us a jet fighter based on a real-world aircraft and a realistic-looking pilot action figure. Yeah, I know. It's hard to believe. Let's kick the tires and light the fires. HCC 788 presents Ace and the Ghost Striker. This is the Ghost Striker X-16 high-tech image targeting combat jet and the pilot Ace. This set was introduced in 1993 and was available in 1993 only. It was discontinued for 1994. The vehicle and figure were only sold together. They were part of the Battle Corps set, which was the general line of G.I. Joe toys in 1993 and 1994. This is the only version of the Ghost Striker. The mold was never reused. This is not the only use of the mold for Ace, though. We will talk about the other vintage versions of Ace later. 1993 was a year in which G.I. Joe leaned heavily into science fiction and fantasy. Despite that, the Ghost Striker and Ace are surprisingly realistic. They even look a little out of place next to other 1993 vehicles. 
For the Ghost Striker, I have to admire the effort and attention to detail in an era when G.I. Joe was drifting into insanity, and many toys were garish, cheap, and disappointing. Ace, on the other hand, reuses a previous figure's mold with different colors. Despite that, the figure has some merit. I will have a lot to say about Ace. The Ghost Striker has electronic lights and sounds. The electronic features on this example are not functional, but I have another incomplete Ghost Striker, and the electronics are working on this one. I will use this example to demonstrate those features later in this video. The name Ghost Striker is probably meant to evoke the original G.I. Joe jet, the Sky Striker. Adding ghost to the name suggests it is stealthy. But stealth is not emphasized in the marketing. The blueprints tout the Ghost Striker's exceptional speed. I'm going to give Ace a thorough review later in this video, but I'm going to set him aside for now so we can take a closer look at the Ghost Striker. The Ghost Striker was modeled after the General Dynamics F-16 Fighting Falcon. The F-16 entered service with the U.S. Air Force in 1978 and was well known at the time the Ghost Striker was produced. The F-16 was officially named the Fighting Falcon, but pilots nicknamed it the Viper. The Ghost Striker isn't an exact copy of the F-16. The proportions are a bit different. It has a few extra bits and bobs that aren't on the real jet. But the inspiration is obvious. The fact that the Ghost Striker is modeled after a real jet is an extra bonus in my book. The Ghost Striker has the designation X-16, which suggests it's an experimental jet. G.I. Joe did this with a lot of their aircraft, like the Sky Striker XP-14F and the Conquest X-30 and the Phantom X-19. The implication is these are experimental upgrades of the original aircraft that have been pressed into service for G.I. Joe. Let's take a look at the parts and the features of the Ghost Striker, starting in the front with the nose cone. The nose cone is molded in gray plastic. The blueprints call it an internal radar processing nose cone. It's a bit fatter than the nose cone on a real F-16. That's because the proportions of the Ghost Striker are just a bit chunkier. Behind the nose cone, we have the canopy. The canopy is dark tinted clear plastic. It looks really good. This example is missing a sticker. The sticker is on my other example. It's this kill mark sticker with four red cobra emblems. The canopy latches in the front and is hinged in the back. To open it up, just pull up at the front. It swings up and reveals a two-seat cockpit. The two-seat cockpit is highly detailed. The details are exceptional. Because it's molded into the body, the cockpit is the same color as the body. Having a darker color plastic would help differentiate it from the exterior. The F-16 was mostly produced as a single seat fighter, but there are two seat variants, so this is still accurate to the real jet. There is a really cool light up feature in the cockpit, which I will show when I fire up the electronics. To place a figure in the cockpit, just put the figure in the seated position with knees slightly bent and slide him in to the pilot seat. Just put him in there as far as he will go. There is enough room for a co-pilot in the back seat. Uh, slide him in there. Make sure he goes in as deeply as he will go. Uh, the canopy will close and there is plenty of room for two action figures in the cockpit. The fuselage is molded in a light gray plastic. Not quite white. It is light gray. It has some exceptional details. Some great technical details. Some panel lines. It even has molded in G.I. Joe logos. That's really cool. On the top of the wings we have light bulbs. There's a green one on one wing and a red one on the other wing. There are more nice panel details. This example is missing a G.I. Joe logo sticker on one wing. That sticker is present on my other example. There are some no step stickers and there is a white stripe that runs the length of both wings and across the fuselage. And I like this. It almost works like a paint application. It's just there to give the jet a bit more depth. On the starboard wing, we have this Ghost Strikers insignia, fighter first wing. It also appears on both sides of the tail. 
This Ghost Strikers badge may be inspired by the real-world U.S. Air Force weapons school insignia. It kind of looks like a unit insignia. I would love to have a whole G.I. Joe air wing called the Ghost Strikers. That would be awesome. Behind the nose cone and under the cockpit, there is the single front jet intake. This mimics the look of the F-16. On this toy, this is a light source for the projector. There is a light bulb in there. Let's flip the Ghost Strikers striker over to see what's on the underside. Looks like it has a little thingy here, so I guess this one is a boy. On the underside we have landing gear. There's the front landing gear with two dark gray wheels on a bright orange strut, and then two rear landing gears, each with one gray wheel on bright orange struts. The landing gear is retractable, but it's manually operated. There is no mechanism to automatically raise and lower the landing gear. You just have to push them back and up to raise the landing gear. And then when you want to land, you just pull them back down to lower them. I have to point out the landing gear is way too short. With the gear extended, this back fin touches the ground. That's gonna make it hard to take off and land. That back fin is gonna scrape the tarmac. This lower fin is not present on the F-16 and I think it's on this toy because the Ghost Striker is back heavy. It tends to tilt backward. So to keep the toy from going nose up, this back fin sort of acts like a kickstand. In the well for the front landing gear, there is a thumb wheel for the projector. Behind that, there's a reset button for the projector. Behind that, there is the pop-out control grip. The rear landing gear are on these pods on the underside of the wings, and each of those has a red tinted light. We will cover all of these when I talk about the electronic features. The Ghost Striker has six missiles. They are all in neon orange. Two of the missiles are what the blueprints call anti-aircraft X-16 Sidewinder missiles. They attach to the wingtips with these dumbbell-shaped slots that fit on pegs. Those pegs are short, so those missiles on the wingtips tend to fall off very easily. Four of the missiles are what the blueprints call high-tech rapid-fire Phoenix missiles. They also attach to the wings in much the same way. They have the slot and they fit on pegs. The pegs on the underside of the wings are uh, much longer and those missiles fit on much more securely. Each wing has a neon green spring-loaded missile launcher. Both missile launchers are the same. They have a trigger in the back and both missile launchers will work with both the Sidewinder and Phoenix missiles. To load the missile launcher, just press any of the six missiles into the missile launcher barrel. Press back until it clicks. To fire, just press down on the trigger in the back. I'll demonstrate the missile launcher by taking a shot at our favorite target, Dr. Mindbender. Oh, what's this? Dr. Mindbender, you're wearing the snake armor. Are you scared? Were you hoping that having some armor would keep you from getting hurt by all these missiles flying at you? No, okay, all right, we'll do it just this time. We'll take a shot at Dr. Mindbender in the snake battle armor. Just aim and press down on the trigger to fire. Ah, oh, that hit him right in the crotch. I hope there's a lot of armor down there. Let's uh, crack him open and see how he is. Ah, there he is. And he's okay. Looks like a hard-boiled egg. On the bottom, in the back, just behind the control grip compartment, we have this fin. And I mentioned it before, I think this fin is only there to keep the toy from tipping backward because it is back heavy. Looking at the plane right side up, we have the rear stabilizer fins with some no-step stickers. Then we have the tail fin, which is in dark gray. It's a darker gray than the nose cone. It's not quite black, it is a dark gray. It has some stickers for realism, and it has that Ghost Strikers insignia that we saw on the wing. This back fin pops off very easily, maybe too easily. It's popped off several times as I've been recording this review. I think this is a feature to keep it from breaking. It's better that it pop off than break off. I do see a lot of Ghost Strikers missing the fin, but I don't see very many broken fins, so that's good. And it's easy enough to just slide back on. We 
finish our look at the exterior body of the Ghost Striker by looking at this single jet engine in the back. Inside it has some support ribs for structure. Uh, it has a nicely molded engine nozzle, but that engine nozzle is molded into the body of the airplane. So as with the cockpit, this would have benefited from being a separate piece in a darker color that really would have enhanced the look of this engine. The blueprints call this a high-tech Mach 10 propulsion turbo thruster. Oh no, it isn't. This jet does not go Mach 10. No jet goes Mach 10. The fastest recorded speed by a crewed powered aircraft was set by the North American X-15 at Mach 6.7. The record was set in 1967 and has never been broken. Mach 10. They might as well just say it goes a million bazillion miles an hour. Now it's time to fire up the electronic features and for that I need my extra incomplete Ghost Striker. She may not look like much, but she has it where it counts. It's my belief that the electronic features on the Ghost Striker were inspired by the 1959 Ideal Fighter Jet. Flight leader to Ideal Fighter Jet, clear for takeoff. Flight leader to ideal fighter jet. Turn indicator on. Red warning light will tell you when you're off course. You're flying by radar. Hold her steady. Enemy plane coming in at 2 o'clock. Enemy out of machine gun range. Set your range finder. Get set to use rockets. He's in my sight. Rockets ready. Fire one. Fire two. Flying in Ideal's electronic fighter jet is like flying a real jet fighter. You work the throttle, indicators, radar scope, and warning light. You control six moving targets via four rocket guns. Like the Ghost Striker, the Ideal fighter jet projected targets on the wall for the jet to shoot at. The Ideal toy was a fighter jet control panel, not a handheld toy plane. The Ideal fighter jet was an amazingly cool toy for its time. It had a lot more features than the Ghost Striker. It was a sophisticated electronic and mechanical flight simulation toy with no use of computers. We tend to think of the 1980s as the best era for toys, but don't underestimate the toys of your parents' generation. They had some amazing toys, some of which were better than what we got in the 80s. To activate the electronic features, flip the grip handle down. The electronic sounds and lights will automatically start. It makes that electronic engine sound, and that can get pretty annoying after a while. Let's take this to a darker room so you can see the light up features. When you pull the grip down, the lights on the wings light up, and the interior light lights up too. There's a light inside the cockpit. Sorry about the noise, I hope you can hear me. Um, I really like the cockpit light. You can pretend like it's the light of the radar screen. That's a very cool feature. The trigger on the pistol grip will activate machine gun and missile sounds. Unfortunately, it's very tough to push on my example. I really have to press down hard to get the sounds to activate. Activating the electronic features also turns on the light in the projector and that will project images through this lens. Just aim it at a wall and you will see projected targets. You can change the target by turning this thumb wheel that's just behind the front landing gear. It has generic crosshairs, uh, it has the Cobra liquidator, uh, that is just a generic Cobra fighter jet. Uh, that is an Air Commandos glider. That is the Cobra Liquidator. And finally, it has a pair of Cobra Rattlers. You can squeeze the trigger to fire at these, and supposedly if you squeeze the trigger eight times, it will make a noise indicating that the target is destroyed. It's really hard to pull this trigger. It's very, uh, it's not very sensitive. I have to really press it down hard. There she goes. There are light bulbs in these pods on the wings with a red tint in front of them, and they should project a red light on the wall. But 
um, I've only been able to get them to activate once, and um, I have no idea exactly what the pattern is for those. I'm trying to show them to you, but uh, they're just not activating for me this time. The projector light is set to switch off after four minutes, at least according to the instructions. There is a reset button on the bottom to turn it back on. There is also a slide on the side, and you can move that back and forth to help focus the projector. It's really unfortunate that the engine sound is constant. It's really loud too so while the projector and light up features are nice unfortunately that engine noise is just too annoying to me here's something to consider the electronic features are fun for a while but they get annoying pretty quickly however that grip on the bottom makes it easier to maneuver the plane around so you may consider just leaving the batteries out and pulling that grip down and it makes it a little easier to play with the plane. Here's the matchup everyone wants to see. The classic 1983 G.I. Joe Sky Striker versus the Ghost Striker. The Sky Striker does not have any electronic features. It doesn't light up, it doesn't make sounds, but you may or may not consider that to be an asset for the Ghost Striker. All of the Sky Striker's features are functional without batteries. The Ghost Striker has spring-loaded missile launchers, which is great if you're a fan of 90s G.I. Joe, but I am, at best, indifferent to the missile launchers, so that's not a plus in my book. The Ghost Striker has more missiles than the Sky Striker, but they're bright orange, which spoils an otherwise really good color scheme. The Sky Striker has functional landing gear, a sweep wing mechanism, removable engine panels, a cockpit with two removable seats, and parachutes. The Ghost Striker has none of those things. What the Ghost Striker has that is undeniably better than the Sky Striker is a highly detailed cockpit. The seats and the instrument panels are very well done, and I appreciate the effort. Now we turn to the pilot of the Ghost Striker. This is Ace. This version of Ace was only available with the Ghost Striker. It is the third version of Ace in the vintage era. The first version of Ace was introduced in 1983 and was included with the Sky Striker. That version was wearing a pressure suit. A pressure suit is worn by pilots flying at very high altitude. It's not the type of flight suit typically worn by fighter pilots. Version 2 of Ace was introduced in 1992 and was included included with the Battlecopter. That version was wearing a G-suit, which is often worn by fighter pilots. The G-suit is designed to prevent blackout caused by high G-forces. He had a more realistic helmet, too. Unfortunately, the colors were a bit off, and he came with a tiny little helicopter, not a jet. Version 3 from 1993, included with the Ghost Striker, finally looks like a proper fighter pilot, and he comes with a proper fighter jet. It reuses the same mold as version 2, but with a much more realistic color scheme. Let's take a look at Ace's accessories. Ace came with an Uzi submachine gun in black plastic. It is reasonably detailed, but not exactly like the real-world weapon. This is a reissue of the Uzi that was first included with 1986 Low Light, and it was used with a lot of other figures. This accessory was reused a lot. This has never been my favorite accessory, and I hate that it's been reused so often. There are better Uzis in the G.I. Joe line, but this is the one that kept being reused. And I don't really need it for this Ace figure. I know sometimes pilots have to punch out over enemy territory and they'll need a weapon, but as a practical matter, this submachine gun is likely to fall down into the cockpit of the Ghost Striker and rattle around in there forever. It wouldn't help him anyway since the Ghost Striker doesn't have an ejector seat and Ace doesn't have a parachute. Even though version 2 and version 3 use the same mold and have almost exactly the same accessories, they do not include the same submachine gun. Version 2 had a black version of the submachine gun that originally came with 1988 Shockwave. According to the file card, Ace is supposed to have a 9mm Beretta pistol. It's even in the picture, but that's not what this is. Ace had a helmet and and air mask assembly. I'm going to take them off together. The hose on the air mask fits in a hole on the figure's chest. You have to pop that out. The helmet fits on quite firmly and is not easy to get off, but with some work, it can be removed. This is the same helmet and air mask that was included with version 2, but in different colors, and in my opinion, better colors. The air mask is in a black, soft, flexible plastic. 
It has an air hose and a peg that connects to a hole on the action figure's chest. The air mask covers the nose and mouth, and it has straps that connect to the sides of the helmet. By pulling the straps off of the pegs on the sides of the helmet, the air mask can be removed. The helmet is also made of a black flexible plastic, and it's a good thing because otherwise it could be quite difficult to get on and off the figure's head. It still fits on quite snugly. It has gold painted goggles that go over the figure's eyes and long pegs on the sides for the air mask. The helmet definitely looks like it's missing something without the air mask. Those pegs on the sides stick out quite far. Because both the helmet and the air mask are made of soft, flexible plastic, you do have to press pretty well to get that air mask on the pegs. There is a major downside to this helmet. It tends to scrape the paint off of the figure's head. I see a lot of version 3 Ace figures with paint scraped off the head. Let's take a look at the articulation on Ace. He had the articulation that was standard for G.I. Joe figures by 1992, so he could turn his head from left to right and look up and down. He could swing his arm up at the shoulder and swivel at the shoulder all the way around. He had a hinge at the elbow that allowed him to bend his arm at the elbow about 90 degrees. He had a swivel at the bicep that allowed him to swivel his arm all the way around. This was an O-ring figure, meaning the figure was held together with a rubber O-ring that looped around the inside. That allowed him to move at the torso a bit. He could move his legs apart about so far. He could bend his leg at the hip about 90 degrees and bend at the knee about 90 degrees. Let's look at the sculpt design and color of Ace, starting with his head. He has a good head sculpt. He has red hair. It's a dark red, closer to auburn. This is a change from both of the previous versions. Version 1 of Ace had brown hair without the slightest hint of red in it. Version 2 had bright red hair. This is the same head sculpt as version 3, uh, but that hair is very bright red. It seems like with the final version, they split the difference between the first two and gave him brownish red. On his neck, he has a red collar that apparently is for an undershirt under his flight suit. On his chest, he has an olive green flight suit. There are some unpainted details on the back and the front. There are a few painted details though. There are some black pouches. There is a gold painted flashlight. And this gold detail here right below where the air hose connects that I guess is supposed to connect to his oxygen system. The file card calls these black pouches emergency signal flare compartments. There are a lot of unpainted details on the chest and the back, like the unpainted straps, the unpainted zipper, the unpainted flotation ring around his neck. They started with a good base color, so they can get away with a few unpainted details. This is a different paint mask than what they used on version 2. On the version 2 figure, uh, they have the straps and the pouches and the straps on the back painted like a harness, and that's good, but they lose the painted details on the pouches and the flashlight. His arms feature long olive green sleeves, minimal detail on those sleeves, and black gloves. His waist piece is green. He has an unpainted belt and straps on that waist piece. And this is another lost paint application from version 2. Uh, those details are painted in on version 2. The legs are olive green, matching the flight suit color. The legs feature unpainted leg coverings with zippered pockets on the outside legs, unpainted zipper details on the upper legs. He has tall black boots. There are straps that go around the back of the boots. The boots look really good. On the right boot there is a pouch and on the left boot there is a black pistol holster. I think some of the details on the file card are a little mixed up. It says this is a leg mounted pistol holster slash ammunition and this is map storage and knife pouch but this is clearly a pistol holster. You could store a knife and a map in this pocket but I think it might be referring to this pouch on the other boot as map storage and knife pouch. The paint applications on the version 2 legs are totally different from version 3. The leg coverings are painted in and the boots don't go up all the way to the top of the pouch and the pistol holster. The paint applications are better on version 2 but I prefer the colors of version 3. It would be easy to knock this figure for unpainted details and it could definitely use more but I give it some leeway because it's such a good looking fighter pilot flight suit. This is how I want to see Ace, not as an astronaut, 
not in aqua blue. The final version of Ace was a real fighter pilot, and I'll take that despite the lack of paint. Let's take a look at Ace's file card. I will have plenty to say about this file card. This file card was inserted in the box with the figure. It was not printed on the back of the box. It has a red backing. There's a portrait of Ace and then a full body illustration with a numbered list of the features. I have referred to that list a few times before. His codename is Ace. He is the fighter pilot. His file name is Brad J. Armbruster. His primary military specialty is fixed wing pilot. Secondary military specialty is intelligence operations. Birthplace is Providence, Rhode Island, and his grade is 03, Captain USAF. Here's where I have to point out some weirdness with this file card. Not so much this file card as the version 2 file card. The information in this top section is the same as on the 1983 file card. Except for the serial number, they often change the serial number. File name Brad J. Armbruster, birthplace Providence, Rhode Island, grade 03, Captain USAF. All of that changed on the version 2 file card. Now he is Wendell L. Armbruster, birthplace Seattle, Washington, and grade 04, USAF major. Maybe you think this is a different guy, maybe Ace's brother using the same code name, but the text of this card refers to him as the original fighter jock jet driver of the G.I. Joe team. This is supposed to be the same guy as version 1. As it turns out, Wendell L. Armbruster was a prototype name for Ace, but it was changed to Brad J. Armbruster before it was released. Apparently, when they reissued the character in 1992, whoever was in charge of file cards at Hasbro grabbed a copy of the prototype file card and copied that rather than the released version. They caught the mistake in 1993 and they changed it back. He is now Brad J. Armbruster again. He's born in Providence, Rhode Island, and his grade has changed back to 03. To add more confusion to Ace's real name controversy, on the Sky Striker, it says he is Captain J. Brad Armbruster. So J is either his first initial or his middle initial, depending on whether you believe the file card or the sticker sheet for the Sky Striker. Not that it necessarily necessarily resolves anything, but the comic book G.I. Joe Order of Battle issue number one on the first page has Ace's file name as Brad J. Armbruster. Back to the 93 card, we have a quote here, presumably from Ace himself. It says, Once an enemy is in my sights, I blast him from the sky and turn and burn back home. The main text of the file card says, Ace would rather fly than do anything else. During high school, he worked after school and weekends to pay for flying lessons. He spent one year flying pipelines in Alaska and two years stunt flying for movies before enlisting in the U.S. Air Force at 22. He joined the G.I. Joe team after serving in pilot combat training school as a senior instructor to the USAF's Fighter Weapons Squadron, in parentheses known to most aviators as the Aggressors. The Aggressors is a real training squadron that is tasked to act as the enemy in U.S. military war games. He's an expert pilot qualified to fly an F-5E, F-16, XP-14F, and the Ghost Striker X-16 jet. He has one major character flaw, cutthroat poker, but in Armbruster's case, you can hardly call it a flaw because he never loses. That's why he's called Ace. If this sounds better than most 90s file cards you've read, and it makes you think of how 80s file cards were written, that's because this is taken almost word for word from the version 1 file card. They added a few things and changed the phrasing around, but this is mostly a copy of 1983. Looking at how Ace was used in G.I. Joe Media, in the animated series, he first appeared in the 1983 miniseries in Part 4. He had numerous appearances in the Sunbow era of the animated series and was prominently featured in a couple episodes. Most of his appearances were minimal, though, as pilot of the Sky Striker. He had no other vintage era animated appearances after the Sunbow series ended. He had no animated appearances in his version 3 uniform. The Ghost Striker also had no animated appearances. A character named Brad J. Armbruster, codename Saberjet, showed up in the Inhumanoids animated series. 
In Humanoids was another toy line by Hasbro. Looking at how Ace was used in the G.I. Joe comic book series published by Marvel Comics, he first appeared in issue number 14. It was not a starring role. He just swooped in and destroyed a Cobra factory. He had some great moments in the comic book series, such as when he faced off against the Cobra pilot Wild Weasel in issue number 34. The Ghost Striker and Ace in his version 3 uniform appeared in issue number 152. That issue was part of the 30th salute anniversary of G.I. Joe. Ace's helmet was recolored red for some reason. Ace was used as a framing device for Joe Colton to tell his Vietnam story. Looking at the Ghost Striker overall, it's impossible to talk about this toy without comparing it to the legendary Sky Striker. Is the Ghost Striker better than the Sky Striker? The Sky Striker has the edge in size. It more closely represents the real world aircraft. The Sky Striker doesn't have neon orange or green, so it wins in the color department. The Sky Striker doesn't have electronic features, but the sweep wing mechanism doesn't require batteries. The Sky Striker doesn't have spring-loaded missile launchers, which the Ghost Striker does, but I am at best indifferent to the firing missiles, so that's not really a plus in my book. The Sky Striker has removable seats and parachutes, which the Ghost Striker does not. The Sky Striker has much better landing gear and a retraction mechanism. The Ghost Striker's landing gear is much too small. I'm front-loading this assessment with some negative points about the Ghost Striker, but that's just to say I like the Sky Striker better. With those points out of the way, I can enthusiastically say I love the Ghost Striker. We have an F-16 in G.I. Joe. That's fantastic. The cockpit is highly detailed. Other than the neon orange and green, the colors are really good. The molded in G.I. Joe logos are cool. I would probably hate the electronic features if it were not for the connection to a classic 1950s toy. The engine noise gets on my nerves. The target shooting is kind of fun for a few minutes. The best features are the cockpit light and the wing lights. I would be happy to just have those lights without all the other bells and whistles. Fortunately, the light and sound gimmicks are done in the best way possible, meaning you can ignore them and play with the Ghost Striker as a normal toy airplane. You can fold up the grip and shut the electronics off. If you want to have the grip down so the toy is easier to hold, you can just remove the batteries and not have to deal with the constant electronic sounds. As for Ace, this is my favorite version of the figure. The first version was fine, but I couldn't picture him as a fighter pilot. Version 3 is Ace as I always imagined him, geared up and ready to fly. It only took us 10 years to get this version. The Ghost Striker and Ace are gems of the 1990s, and they came out in a year that a lot of collectors consider to be the worst year. It just goes to show there are good G.I. Joe toys in every year. That was my review of Ace and the Ghost Striker. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks again to Iron Steel Tiger Grenadier Elimination Eco Brigade Force. Next week, we're going to take a brief break from the 90s and get back to the 80s. I hope to see you then. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, I'm making more like it. So please give this video a thumbs up on YouTube, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the notification bell so you don't miss any future videos, and share this video with your friends. That's what helps this channel grow. You can find me on social media, on Facebook and Twitter, and I have a website, hcc788.com. If you want to know if I've already reviewed a vintage G.I. Joe item, that's a good place to check. Special thanks to all my supporters on Patreon, Patreon, including the names you see on the screen now. Support on Patreon helps keep this show going, so if you like the show and you'd like to support the show in that way, please consider checking out Patreon. You can get some special rewards, including early access to reviews, and you can find out how to decode the secret messages you see in these videos. Thank you for joining me on this adventure of collecting vintage G.I. Joe toys. I'll see you next time, and until then, remember, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe.